If you're old, like I am, you'll know all about these. But how much do you know about these? This is The Righteous Bo Jambo, and it's time to talk about the Beatles. Number 22, you know my name, look up the number, which was the B-side of Let It Be. Charmless tomfoolery which accomplished nothing by sullying the name of the band who'd just released their last single in their home country. Number 21, Yes It Is, which was the B-side of Ticket to Ride. A lot of the time the early Beatles B-sides are an interesting little piece of obscuritania that we rediscover with the delight and pleasure of an ice cream cone on a sunny day. This song is not one of them. While it's not without its fervent admirers, Paul McCartney included largely for the harmonies, I find the song a drudge and a poor job of work in the recording. Number 20, Ask Me Why, the B-side of Please Please Me. One of the Beatles' most open tributes to Smokey Robinson, even going so far as to appropriate the opening guitar figure from Smokey's What's So Good About Goodbye. Beyond that insight, the song is, however, pretty much by the numbers, the kind of thing that might have been handed on to Jerry and the Pacemakers or Billy J. Kramer had the band's pace of work been a little less fraught. Number 19, P.S. I Love You, which was the B-side of Love Me Do. At one point, considered for an A-side release, session producer Ron Richard quickly poo-pooed this, and it's not hard to see why. The best element of the song is Andy White's drumming, a steady and propulsive cha-cha-cha beat, with some inventive little fills and McCartney's injection of a bit of vocal passion at the end. Given the slightness of the A-side, this makes for one of the group's least substantial singles packages. Number 18, She's a Woman, which was the B-side of I Feel Fine. An interesting sounding record until you listen to it at least with a little depth. The first session was knocked over in two hours and the boys make a pretty sloppy job of work of it. While Lennon misses key changes with his stabbing guitar, to its credit, McCartney's worthy bass is probing and unlike anything that he'd recorded previously. Ringo tries his best to hold Lennon's sloppy guitar work together and Harrison comes in at a later session to dub on a nice solo. Lyrics are kind of iffy and the lack of backing vocals is noteworthy. Probably written as a rocker for live gigs and made the B-side as a sop to McCartney who was going through a bit of a lean time songwriting wise then. Number 17, Thank You Girl, which was the B-side of From Me To You. Another song without any real inspiration, although the performance is quite lively, the song does mark a milestone of sorts in the evolution of the overall songwriting style. They are now looking to include as many first, second, third person references in song titles and grasping the emerging importance of a snazzy title. And they're looking for distinctive vocal or lyrical hooks to grab the listener, all of which came to head on the earth-shattering next single, She Loves You. Number 16, Yellow Submarine, which was the B-side of Eleanor Rigby. Would that this were a purely subjective list, this would be number 22, as I cannot abide this song. 
Beloved of millions, I know, but something about it just rubs me the wrong way every time. So much so that I can barely think of a worse song that landed up on a better album. Gets a few bonus points for the fact that neither I nor anyone else quite understand why I despise it so. Number 15, This Boy, the B-side of I Wanna Hold Your Hand. When the group sang multi-part harmonies, they were generally a delight. Add to this Lennon's impassioned middle eight and Harrison's elegant guitar figure over the coda, and you have the ideal song to back up I Wanna Hold Your Hand's assault on popular culture. The first, sixth, fourth, fifth chord progression was later reused in songs as diverse as Happiness is a Warm Gun, Let It Be, Octopus's Garden, Tell Me Why, and I think Strawberry Feels Forever, but there's a lot of weird stuff going on in that song. Number 14, I'll Get You, which was the B-side of She Loves You. Something of a favourite of McCartney's, who wheels it out now and then in his tour set, this song, under its slightly over-confected vocals, is quite a powerful rocker. It really chugs along. Nothing too fancy, but it hits you where a good rock and roll record should. Nice middle eight as well, even allowing for Lennon and McCartney singing different words at one point. Uh, McCartney sings when I'm going to change your mind, and Lennon sings I'm going to make your mind. Pales next to the A-side, but then most songs ever recorded to that point did as well. Number 13, I'm Down, which was the B-side of Help. Rubbish song, but what a record. Pure, thrilling enjoyment. Clearly nothing to be taken seriously, but the way Ringo slams his way through it and Lennon and McCartney lock in with really ferocious groove, and, and groove goes a long, long way on this record. Number 12, We Can Work It Out, which was the B-side of Day Tripper. We're at the point now where the B-sides start to match and in some case surpass the A-side. This is a glorious song, generous of spirit, wonderfully sung and played and full of the kind of enduring songcraft that's been the group's hallmark for history. Coming out as it did in December 1965, it represented a high watermark for the folk rock movement and the A-side Day Tripper gave an insight into the decadent society of the next two years. Number 11, Old Brown Shoe, which was the B-side of the Ballad of John and Yoko. Apart from You Know My Name, is there any more obscure piece that the Beatles have in their catalogue? It doesn't really warrant any level of disregard, as it's a bullishly good-natured little piece of music with a particularly cool bass line, a vocal from Harrison that could be a touch fuller but still radiates joy. Probably not entirely worthy of an A-side release, although the A-side was in and of itself the weakest single the Beatles ever issued. It would certainly have given the somewhat glum-sounding Let It Be album a boost, and it may even have been a remedy to what I like to call the vortex of suck on side one of Abbey Road, which was Maxwell's Silver Hammer, Oh Darling and Octopus's Garden. They could have flipped Maxwell's Silver Hammer, moved up Oh Darling and put Old Brown Shoe in between it and Octopus's Garden. Number 10, Baby You're a Rich Man, which was the B-side of All You Need Is Love. The first song recorded and mixed entirely away from Abbey Road, which would account for the more spacious sound. Baby You're a Rich Man is one of the group's most detailed yet random seeming recordings, enjoying a variety of exotic instruments and employing vocal flavours with big, fun sing-along choruses. Have a close listen at 2 minutes 47 seconds for John being a little bit naughty. Number 9, You Can't Do That, which was the B-side of Can't Buy Me Love. People look back and wonder what all this Beatlemania fuss was about. Well, it was all about records like this. This was the first song that John Lennon played lead guitar on and was originally slated as the A-side until Can't Buy Me Love came along. I doubt the overall quality of the catalogue would have changed had it remained the A-side. Number 8, Come Together, which was the B-side of something. Another of those double A-sides, which fortunately is not as difficult to resolve. While Come Together is zeitgeisty and funky and fits with the saint of peace that was John Lennon narrative, it's not in the same park as a song or a recording or something. Plus. Come Together is on the sliced side of the apple on the 45 label, so that says B to me. Good song and a perfect album opener for Abbey Road. As Lennon said to David Sheff in 1980, you can dance to it, I'd buy it. 
Number seven, the things we said today, B-side of A Hard Day's Night. A record that sounds like nothing that had gone heretofore, both in terms of its musical maturity and lyrical outlook, Things We Said Today is arguably the first recording to use the arrangement, key and ambiance to evoke the specific mood of the song, which became one of the group's calling cards on albums to come. Given the majesty of the A-side, it was never likely for single release, but it's one of the very finest compositions in the band's catalogue nonetheless. Number 6. I Am The Walrus, which was the B-side of Hello Goodbye. All I can think is that Lennon was in need of a few extra quid to get through the busy Christmas season of 1967. Julian needs a new bike, Murray the K could use a fresh beetle wig, and that mad Japanese woman has to be fobbed off with something. A sack of ants, a conceptual doorknob, a portrait of a horse that just lost heavily on the stock exchange, or whatever. When he allowed this to go out as the B-side of the abomination that is Hello Goodbye, a towering juggernaut of nonsense built on an unshakable pillar of descending major chords, topped with one of Lennon's greatest vocals, it is in its own perverse way, their good vibrations, only instead of a farewell to an era with the sparkling reflection of sunlight on a lover's golden hair, this does so more in the manner of a Wagnerian funeral scene. Number 5, Don't Let Me Down, which was the B-side of Get Back. Another magnificent Lennon song relegated to the B-side behind another of Macca's smiley smashes. The song deserved much better at the time, at the very least a release on the Let It Be album, although recently its reputation has risen considerably as one of the most powerful pieces in the band's body of work. Number 4, Revolution, which was the B-side of Hey Jude. A wry, powerful song with a very fine tipping point between defensive cynicism and overweening sarcasm and a better recording than the one on the White Album. Count Me Out suits the generally couldn't be asked Lennon far better than Count Me In does. The one long-term drawback of this song was that it attempted Lennon into the illusion that he could write political songs, thus scuppering his career for most of the early 1970s. Is it better than Hey Jude? Well, let's not say better, let's just say less likely to sell 8 million copies. Number three, The Inner Light, which was the B-side of Lady Madonna. A B-side that utterly eclipses its A-side, with very possibly the loveliest melody on any of their recordings. Too often in the period between Sgt Pepper and Abbey Road, Harrison's released songs miss the mark, but this one is bang on with its surprising sweetness and perfection. Number two, Penny Lane, which was the B-side of Strawberry Fields Forever. Why wasn't this issued independently of the masterpiece of Strawberry Fields Forever? They had When I'm 64 in the can, they could have used that as Strawberry Fields B-side. It would have made my job a lot easier for a start. In what is largely McCartney's surprisingly clear-eyed and unsentimental view of the bustling and colourful Penny Lane Market District, the Penny Lane Street Parade passes on in the fullest production the band has ever issued. Given they now no longer intended to tour, they had clearly determined themselves to making records that could outdo the limitations of stagecraft in complexity. Never before had the band had a lusher, more accomplished production. Still rooted in rock thanks to Ringo's super solid drumming, McCartney's bass bobbles with the same sunny confidence of the song, and the percussion festoons the tune with gaiety. Wonderful. Oh, and watching Ringo fall off his horse in those promo films is pretty hilarious too. Number one, Rain, the B-side of Paperback Writer. Rain is a punishing battery, an oral assault, a pummeling throb of sound that comes as close to my mind as defining the genre of psychedelia as anything ever did. All four excel in their contributions here, and for Paul and Ringo they enjoy perhaps their finest hours as Beatles. A curious thing is that in researching for this, I found this song highly divisive on Beatle forums. A handful felt like me that it's a classic of its time and a bridge to new music. Others felt that it was a cool sounding record but meant nothing more as a song, and about the same or completely apathetic as to its charms. 
Change is always divisive, I guess, and great change more so. But rain was the bellwether for August's mighty wind, the stunning revolver. Guten Morgen, meine Freunde. I hope you found today's presentation to be interesting and that it piqued your curiosity. Topics for comment and conversation below are fairly straightforward this week. Firstly, I would revel in your opinion on the list. Um, which songs upon it would you elevate to loftier realms and which ones would you denigrate and relegate to the gloomier lower end of the list? The other question might be your reflections on other groups which provided superior b-sides or interesting b-sides or b-sides which consistently showed a different flavour to the group's musical palette. That would be fascinating to hear and I believe we'd all benefit from that. So until the next time we all gather in good fellowship and company, or until the nasty YouTube when we shut this channel down, you keep listening to the good stuff and you stay righteous. Coming out as it did in December 1965, it represented a high watermark and along with the Dayside A-Tripper,